Hello and welcome to the Skylander Spurs Adventure Developer Commentary. It gives me great pleasure to introduce you to the design analyst, Mike Stout. I came in, let's see, so this would have been October, I think, of 2008. Uh, and it was still really early in development. Uh, we had, uh, you know, still these real rickety looking portals that had all these wires sticking out of them that I was nervous to take through airport security. Uh, and I had just started at Activision as it was my first publisher side work that I'd ever done. Up to that point, I'd only ever worked on the developer side. Uh, and I was called a design analyst. My job was to fly to the various Activision owned developers, uh, like Toys for Bob or Vicarious Visions and, uh, basically communicate feedback to them from Activision and work with them on smoothing out aspects of the game that Activision wanted to see smoothed out. And additionally, offer my services to them for anything that they wanted my help with. Uh, in the case of Skylanders, I, uh, I was up there all the time. Like uh, I was spending two days a week up at Toys for Bob in Northern California helping out. And then I'd spend the rest of the week down in Southern California uh, working at Activision or you know, being at home. Uh, it was me and Mike Graham. Mike Graham was the design producer uh, at Activision. And when we come to when we come to Toys for Bob, uh, they, they would often say the mics are visiting because it would be the two of us. So generally what I what I would do on Skylander specifically, uh, man, I, I touched pretty much every aspect of the game. Uh, the first thing we worked on was combat. Uh, then we worked on level design, and we worked on, um, you know, like uh, how do we get the player to switch Skylanders without forcing them to switch Skylanders, and how do we solve various problems that have never shown up in game design before, like what happens if somebody wants to play level one with a fully leveled up Skylander? What do we do? You know, that sort of thing. Uh, also, early on. Uh, we didn't have the tech yet to store stuff in the toys. Uh, so the design was very different. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff we could talk about it, about what it was like when I first started. Uh, and then I, I just sort of helped shepherd it through till the end of development. It was my main focus for the first, I think, year and a half, two years I was at Activision. Wow. So yeah, sounds like you've done an insane amount for the game. Yeah, they gave, they credited me with outside design director, which was I, I wasn't expecting that. That was really nice of Toys for Bob to give give that to me. That's, that's awesome. Um, so you said you did uh, some game design. Was there any specific chapters that you uh, primarily worked on? Oh, let's see. Um, so <laughs> I'm not going to remember the actual names of these that's levels. Fair. <laughs> okay. Uh, there's one level that goes, uh, there's like a tornado in the middle and the level's being ripped apart. Oh, Stormy Stronghold. Yes, Stormy Stronghold. So that was one of the really early levels uh, in the first, in, um, that was one of the first levels we made that was for what Skylanders eventually was, uh, as opposed to Spyro's Kingdom, which was a slightly different game that we'd been making before that. So, so Stormy Stronghold, I helped out a lot on. Um, and I can talk to you a lot about how it, how that went. Um, what else uh, level wise? I, I gave feedback on all the levels, so I would I would be constantly playing the game and saying, "Oh, okay, in this area, it's sort of unclear what question the game is asking the player. Here's how we can fix that up." I was at most of the user tests. Uh, we user tested this game uh, probably after after a year. We we started user testing this game a lot. And it was every week we'd have several players in to play the game from outside. And, you know, we'd have feedback. Uh, we live streamed it so that people could watch it. It was, uh, uh, so there was a lot of iteration going on that I was part of on the Activision side. Uh, and then also when I would make my trips up, I would work with them on specific things. So like uh, this week we're talking about what's the Overland map going to be like, or is there going to be an Overland map or, you know, uh, a lot of different, uh, uh, a lot of different and varied things that I worked on. Uh, I think on Giants, and this is a little bit out of the scope, but like on Giants, I even came in and helped script some of the uh, 
arena challenges. Oh, cool. From Brock. Yeah. So it was, it was a, it was a big varied list. Did anything that I mentioned there sound like something you wanted to dive into? I, I mean, a- anything you want to talk about is wonderful. Um, so, I mean, you go, go back to, I guess, Stormy Stronghold. Um, right. Yeah. How, how did that level change over time? It changed a lot. Wow. So, uh, when it first started out, uh, the, the tornado at the center was always part of the level. That was the, the idea was that as you went on, you were kind of reconstructing the level from these bits that had been flying out in the tornado. Uh, and it was, I think it was inspired a lot by the Lego games at the time. Uh, they had a lot of things where uh, you were generally walking through these very interesting spaces. Sometimes you'd be fighting, but it was very simple. Uh, and then you'd have these really interesting sections where you'd hold a button down or do a little tapping or something, and it would assemble something for you, like a Lego set. And it was always really satisfying, even though you know you weren't the game wasn't asking you questions with it. It was just very satisfying on a gut level, right? But that's all that the level had at the time was that satisfying reassembling feeling. Mm. Uh, so a lot of what I was helping out with at the beginning was, okay, what does uh, what does a Skylanders combat setup look like, right? Uh, what are our enemy archetypes? What uh, and I gave a whole talk on what this ended up being uh, at GDC. I think you can find that on the the GDC vault called. Uh, something like looking into the toy chest or something like that. Uh, basically, I, I took a top-down snapshot of what we had for the level, and I wrote over it in Illustrator, and I said, okay, here we're going to have some elves that attack you, and here we're going to have some chompies that run out, here we're going to do this and this. And I just filled in where the enemies would be and how many of each enemy there would be. and like This is kind of the ramp we want to have uh, to make sure that First, we'd introduce an enemy to you simply and singly, and then we'd introduce another enemy, and then we'd combine the two enemies or some sort of hazard in the environment, right? And uh, so I, I, I laid that out on paper and uh, or in Illustrator, but you know you can print it out. And uh, the other thing that we didn't have at that point was like, you know, we got the enemies in and I was going through and I was thinking like, this, this is missing something. What's it missing? And it felt very similar to on Ratchet, uh, something Tony talked about uh, in our developer commentaries. He said, uh, you know, we would just be playing through the level and be like, why isn't this level fun? Oh, we, nobody's placed crates yet, right? And I thought, oh, we don't have breakables in the level. Mm. So then we went through and put a whole bunch of breakables in. And all of a sudden, it all came together, right? The, the formula for a Skylanders level is tons of interesting breakables, uh, enemies that are simple separately from each other, but complex when combined with each other, and who can be handled in different ways more efficiently by different Skylanders with different abilities. Uh, and so that level was kind of a first stab at nailing what this Skylanders combat system was going to be and nailing what a, a Skylanders level would feel like. So that was uh, Stormy Stronghold. The core design principle behind combat gameplay, I think in any game, but especially in Skylanders, was what I like to call the big question. Now, I, I always like to say that games are a, a, a dialogue between the designer and the gamer. The designer asks questions, the gamer answers questions using the things that he has at his disposal. So the big question when it comes to combat is who do you want to attack next? Uh, a lot of time, and I'll get into kind of uh, the, the, the smaller questions later, but a lot of times we as designers tend to focus on the little things that the enemies are doing, the scissors, paper, rock relationship. But without this larger context, it doesn't actually make that much of a difference. The way that we achieved uh, this, this crazy feat of parallel design was through the power of archetypes. For hero design, enemy design, level design, we came up with these archetypical situations or powers or uh, questions that they're asking you so that when a level designer was designing a level, he didn't necessarily have to know exactly what the enemy was in order to come up with a good intensity ramp for the enemies that he would have. 
Uh, the same went for the enemy designers and the hero designers. Uh, in the enemy design of Skylanders, we had four main archetypes of enemies. And I'm going to go into each one of these, but the four archetypes are near enemies, far enemies, swarmers, and heavies. Now this, is, uh, this isn't anything new. Like pretty much every game uses this. Um, if you go look at Halo, if you go look at Zelda, if you go look at uh, Bioshock, you know, uh, games with combat tend to have these four types of enemies because they work. Uh, and when you, when you put them together, they become greater than the sum of their individual parts. Uh, there were a whole bunch of other levels that were going on at the time for this, the Spyro's Kingdom concept, uh, which was it had, uh, like, instead of being a Skylander, uh, Spyro was the king of the kingdom, and he was, like, giving you your tasks and stuff, so you never got to play as Spyro. And uh, ultimately, what we heard from everybody is we want to play as Spyro. So we made the obvious choice and made Spyro one of the Skylanders, but it changed the whole sort of concept around. Instead of like building up a kingdom for Spyro, it was you and Spyro are going on these adventures with these Skylanders. Huh, that's really cool. Uh, I think also at this point we should mention that... Uh, you do have a set of developer commentaries on your channel, Useless Podcasts, um, which is for Ratchet 2, 3, and we did a bit of Ratchet 1. Um, yes. Because you yeah. were uh, a developer on that game. Yeah, people uh, people really like those. Uh, yeah, they're awesome. Been getting a lot of... I mean, that's why this series exists. <laughs> Purely <laughs> you. Really? And you inspiring me. Oh, thanks. Man. So, yeah. I mean, like, I, I, when I... You know, saw those series. It was just, it was the most fascinating thing to learn about uh, games that I loved so much. Um, and and then we started talking, and you know, you you're just the the best guy. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Deal. So yeah, it's uh, thank you for creating those series because without that, this would not be here. <laughs> you were saying something right before that. What were you saying? Not that I want to, you know, get you off the complimenting me thing. It's just your channel. Um, oh, right, I just right. mentioned you uh, had a channel and that you worked on Ratchet. Yeah, breakables. The breakables super important, man. Yeah, it's, it's hard to it's hard to underestimate how important it is to break something and have something shiny fall out of it that you can collect. Yeah, it, it is satisfying. I agree. Um, oh, man, yeah. <laughs> um, quickly go, to go uh, back to user testing. Um, yeah. So, yeah, you said um, you uh, did user tests. That's uh, presumably to get uh, people, um, presumably of the target audience, uh, to try out the game. Is that... Am I correct? Yeah, you? yeah. You are correct. So, yeah, so there's sort of two, uh, several different types of testing we do on a game. Uh, you know, you everybody's heard of QA testing, and that's when we uh, people employed by the studio uh, play the game looking for bugs to help fix the game. Uh, there's also focus testing, which is done by marketing. Uh, and that the goal of that is to find out, uh, usually it's, would you like this product if we made it, right? That's sort of what a focus test is for. And then the thing you're asking me about is user testing, where we bring in people from the outside, people who have played similar games to what we were making, or people who, uh, already you know in the case of sequels right have you played the other skylanders games do you like them right uh and who are in sort of the age range that we're looking for and we bring them in and have them play parts of the unfinished game that we want to get feedback on and uh on skylanders uh eventually probably uh, around the time that uh, uh it'd be about a year in uh, we were doing user testing every week. We would bring in two to four uh, people, usually in the, uh, depending on whether we wanted to get older or younger uh, people playing the game, uh, you know, being like the six to 12 range. Sometimes we'd bring in even younger people or even older people, or we'd bring in families and test it with the family playing together. You know, uh, we'd be testing here's a set of levels we want to test, or we want to test this feature, we want to see, uh, 
you know, uh, if you play this level in co-op all the way through, do you run into any issues, you know, gameplay wise we hadn't run into before? And then we as the developers actually watch people play and we figure out, okay, so based on what we want the game to be doing, is the game doing that, right? We're watching people play uh, and we think it should be, you know, level five hard. And everybody's telling us it's level 29 hard, right? <laughs> we need to do, we need to dial this back a bit. Or we wanted this to be level 29 hard and everyone's telling us it's level five hard, right? It could be either way. Um, so it's, it's sort of trying to tune the game, the questions that the gamer are asking and, and make sure that everything is clear so that the player knows what the game wants them to do. And then they can just go do it without us having to, you know, get in their way and tell them what to do. Uh, so a lot of times uh, we'd have puzzles in the levels and uh, we'd have people try to play, uh, like a whole group of people try to play through these puzzles. And then we'd have the people who designed the puzzles watching them play. Uh, so like the, the Lockmaster puzzles, for example, uh, I, uh, I actually came up with the original design for the Lockmaster puzzles. And then another designer uh, actually designed all the individual puzzles and did all the, the actual work of, of making the, the, uh, the Lockmaster. But uh, I would give feedback on those puzzles when I would see, uh, oh, you know, I thought someone would be able to figure this puzzle out in 10 or 15 turns and it's taking them 50. Right? right. How can we how can we alter the design of this puzzle so it's more in line with what we want, right? Some people take a little bit longer, some people get it a little quicker, but on average they're doing what we want. Uh, so it'd be you know, lockmaster puzzles, boss battles, uh, level designs, mini games, all of that stuff. Uh, we were constantly testing that. And Activision has a really cool setup for that sort of thing where uh, we can stream it out to the developers in real time. Uh, like back on Ratchet, we'd have to watch these on VHS cassettes after the fact. If, if you didn't actually fly up and watch them, right? We didn't have any way of watching them in real time. But That's now we can, cool. we can iterate. Yeah, we can iterate and make changes so much faster than, than we used to be able to. Was live streaming that good back in 2010, 2011? It was good if you spent a lot of money right. building the system, <laughs> uh, which Activision did. Uh, it wasn't like, you know, not like Twitch now, right? yeah, where course. there's so so much commercially available hardware and software now that the capabilities you have at the developer and publisher level are even crazier. <laughs> uh, things like tracking eye you know eye tracking you get a little red dot showing where the person's looking on the screen or just such cool stuff uh but you know back then we were just entranced at being able to see it live mm. and we uh we eventually would get it to the point where we'd have a camera showing us uh what was happening in the game so it would be streaming the game feed to us at the same time as showing the portal so we could see what they were doing with their hands in the portal and their face so we could see whether they were happy or upset and compare that to what we were looking for and then change things accordingly so it, it, we had a whole bunch of tools uh, that based on technology you know that i hadn't seen before uh so user testing was really cool so with uh the internet being so like accessible and and it's easy to share information. Is there ever a fear that people are going to leak what is played in user tests? I mean, it's always possible. It's it's always been possible. And it's never been easier than it is right now. Usually when when people play in a user test, they sign a, an agreement saying that they won't talk about what they see. And for the most part, people do. Uh, usually leaks don't come from user testing participants uh, although you know it's, it's been known to happen mm. but you take you take a risk at that point we need people playing the game we yeah need of course. To, we need to be able to see whether the game is meeting our expectations uh whether it's working for the people that we want it to work for uh especially for something experimental like skylanders where we didn't have any idea uh like i mentioned earlier how do you make a game where you don't know how powerful the main character 
right? Like nobody had ever asked that question. How do you make a fun combat system when the player could be anything from way too weak to way too strong? It was something we were discovering while we were while we were making this, right? And uh, the, I mean, we eventually did figure that out, but it was in large part due to being able to try a lot of things and see how they worked with user testing. So, what was the most rewarding part of user tests? Oh yeah, let's see. Um, user tests are not rewarding. <laughs> 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 Please elaborate. <laughs> User tests are pain and trauma, man. Like uh, the you know, not necessarily for the participants, although depending on how crashy the build is, you know. But uh, when you're a developer, watching somebody fail at a thing that you wanted them to be fun is very difficult, right? So rewarding is when when it works out the way that you hoped which usually doesn't happen in a user test because you're only testing the things that you know you don't know work, right? Uh, but probably if there were satisfying moments, it was when we'd get feedback and it would be so much stronger than we were thinking. Like, uh, it's just like this, like when, when, when people would say, you have something here, like this is great, how can I buy this, right? That kind of stuff is really cool, but it's not what you expect when you go into user testing. Like. You go into user testing because you, you're going to watch some people suffer for a while. Uh, and the, the net result of their suffering is that the general audience won't have to suffer through that. You know, uh, I used to say uh, in game design, uh, some of us have this idea that uh, a game designer needs to have their spirit tamed a bit, right? Like, like a wild horse, say. Uh, and they're not really useful until you break them in a little. Uh, and what we do to break them in is we send them to user tests. <laughs> uh, where you, you, you watch somebody play something that you made and that you thought would be fun, and it ends up being torture to them, right? And then you figure out how to make it better, and the next time you send it to a user test, it's the way you wanted it to be. That's, that's gratifying. Hmm. Uh, but generally speaking, the point of a user test isn't <laughs> isn't gratification, it's pain. It didn't even occur to me that, yeah, the build wouldn't actually be that stable, would it? Because it's still in development. Oh, yeah. And I'm just thinking, oh, yeah, people are going to play a game that's, you know, running smoothly. It's just not finely tuned. But no, it's going to be a mess at times, isn't it? Exactly, yeah. Oh. I mean, the, <laughs> we, we, we would get, everybody would get together. You would free, you'd freeze all development and you'd... You do uh, on, on those on that part of the game you were testing, and you uh, have QA run up all the bugs and you fix all the bugs. But like, uh, all of this is happening while the game is still live, right? So things can change and things can go in at the last minute. And you get a build, and then maybe the next day you have to have a second build, and all the save data disappears. Or you know, there's all sorts of things that can happen that you just have to make the best out of when you run the test. Uh, but we do the best to have a build that's stable enough that we can find out what we're looking for. Uh, but you know, early on, uh, it was it was stuff we were we didn't even know would need to be stable. Like, for example, what happens when you put two Skylanders on the portal almost at the same time, or what happens if one character yanks both toys off the portal and then only puts one back on? Or how do you know what order they were put on? Because you don't. Uh, or who's controlling which character. Like, there's all these things that the portal makes it look really easy and invisible that are the result of, you know, hundreds of hours of people trying to use this thing and us finding all of these edge cases and solving them before we ever shipped it. You know, like, at the end, uh, uh, like, we, this thing was... We, we had gotten back, like, packaging instructions, and we realized... Oh crap! We never teach people how to turn the portal on, mm. right? Like if you have the wireless portal, we have to teach you that. Uh, we we need we need to user test the 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 process of setting the portal up for the first time because nobody's ever done this, you know. Mm. In the case of the, I think the first time you played it, you had a uh, a wired portal, right? Yes, and I couldn't find the button because it was 
bizarrely camouflaged into it. Like I just, yeah, it just I looked, remember, and it just looked identical to me. I just couldn't. And I remember see, like, thinking, little... "No, we called that out. That was a thing that we found." You know, that sort of thing. It was just, yeah. I was like, we knew that people would have problems with it, and then eventually you figured it out, and you blamed yourself, which you know it wasn't your fault. But uh, you know, we we at least the you know those those screens that show up saying, "Have you turned on the power button?" have you plugged in the USB dongle, right? Like those were things that we realized we needed because we did the user testing. Mm. And and they came in very, very late in the process. Going back to, you mentioned builds. How often is a build made? Constantly. So like how many, like every day, a couple of times a day? Like how, how much does it happen? Constantly. Right. I mean, <laughs> like there, there's a machine that's constantly making it. Oh, I see. Right. Okay. Right, like uh, how many get put on discs, or you know, how many are archived specifically to, you know, like this one we're sending to E3, or this one we're uh, we're using to, uh, you know, for the user test, or this one gets sent to. Back in the day, you know, we'd send builds to magazines to give in, in on discs, right? Mm. Uh, it. Uh, it, it really depends on how many of those things you need to do as to how many archived, how many builds get archived, right? Official builds, but they're made constantly. Fascinating. And you could, you know, you could make it at your own desk if you wanted to have your own personal build with just the stuff that's on your desk. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. It's, uh, 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 these days building a game takes so long that you need to have a machine just constantly building it, and then you get the latest one uh, and use that as long as you can, and then get a, a more recent one and so forth. And do you have to reset anything to get the new build, or does it just somehow update it while you're while you're working? Uh, usually, there's some sort of in-house tool you've got for it. Uh, I know, like with Unreal, uh, they've got a tool uh, like Epic distributes a tool with with unreal engine that uh will let everybody sync up with builds stuff like that because if you think about it uh what happens if i have build number three seven six four five two and you have build number three seven six five nine eight and i make a change and then you import my change does my change work on your right build? yeah of course right like we we have to sort of synchronize and make sure that we're we're able to tell who has what and and it ends up uh, it ends up working pretty well. It's just you need to have tools in place for it, and it's something that uh, is a lot more common now. Than it used to be, you know, say in the Ratchet and Clank era, uh, we started doing it really around PS3 time. That's when it got really like the assets were so big that pulling down a pulling down a build and making your own was a, a huge deal. You needed a, a really monster PC to to do the builds fast. Go back to Skylanders. I'm gonna make you choose your baby. Uh, which, which is your favorite Skylander? Which is your favorite kid? How do you how do you choose? Wrecking that? Ball. Ah, oh, nice. Uh, and with Stealth Elf as a runner-up, I think mm. Stealth Elf was one of the most popular Skylanders ever. So I feel like I'm cheating a bit if I say Stealth Elf. But other than that, Wrecking Ball. Uh, from from the first game. Uh, if you count the whole franchise, I think. Uh, uh, who was uh, Chopper, the the T Rex that has the baby T Rex with a helicopter backpack? Yeah, yeah, he's he's adorable. <laughs> uh, and Wrecking Ball, he was he was always cute, right? Uh, we had to make we had to work really hard to make threatening enough to feel like he was a uh, going to be an effective combat character just by looking at the toy, and even. And even at the end, even through all the extra threatening stuff we added, I always thought he was the cutest one. So <laughs> that's why he's my favorite. That's awesome. Uh, so what were the biggest challenges in developing the game? Mm, uh, I alluded to this earlier. Uh, from a design perspective, the game had a whole bunch of things that, that nobody's ever had to deal with before, to my knowledge. Like... Uh, once we uh, once we, we we figured out the tech for storing the data for an individual uh, Skylander on the toy, all of a sudden that toy can go anywhere, 
and be used by anyone in any level at any time. It can be fully max leveled up with all the power, or it could be a brand new, fresh out of the box toy. And, uh, you know, you could be in level one or you could be in. Right. So the, the game had to be fun in all of those edge cases. And that the idea of uh, uh, how, how do you make a game that's fun just to play, even if it's uh, so like if the player chooses to use a max level Skylander on an early level, they're choosing to play the game easier. Right. Like. All of a sudden, we were learning that the way people wanted to play with Skylanders were similar to the way they played with toys, which is they want to do whatever they want, right? They want to, they've spent time on this. They have a relationship with this monster. It needs to behave the way they expect it to behave when they use it. And so being able to just bring it in, you know, when they wanted it, when they, when they you know, their fully leveled up character in the middle, we had to let them do that. The way that we worked around uh, the problem of difficulty is we I'm trying to figure out a succinct way to, to put it, but it's uh, it's a combination of level design, uh, enemy design, and then which powers the Skylanders have. Uh, so generally speaking, there were four kinds of Skylander attack that you could have. Uh, and each of those corresponded roughly to one of four types of obstacles we could put in the level design. Uh, and all of those things could complicate uh, each of the enemy types we would have in a level, right? Because each of the enemy types, so let's say you had four different types of enemies in a level, right? One enemy type would be weak to, uh, you know, like say say the chompies, right? Uh, the, you could kill a lot of chompies if you have an attack area damage, but not every Skylander has area damage, right? Uh, so where the chompies are, which Skylanders you have, and what... Uh, what the environment is doing to make it harder for you to use your ability to use the enemies, all three of those things would come together to make it so that the level was always asking you an interesting question, even if it wasn't difficult, right? So it's like, uh, think about the game Diner Dash. It's a, uh, it's a, uh, I think originally it was a flash game, but uh, nowadays it's, it's, it's a uh, really famous as a casual game. Basically, you take a waitress around to different tables and you basically either bring them food or take their order or whatever the table needs at the time, but you have to manage the restaurant such that you know no, no guests get up and leave angrily because you haven't served them or things like that. Mm -hmm. And it requires a very small amount of tactical ability, right? Uh, meaning, the actual thing that you do in the game is not that hard. You you either are clicking on this thing or you're clicking on that thing. There's there's not a lot of dexterity required, and a lot of uh, you know you you you're making much higher level strategic decisions. You're making decisions about uh, what what goals you're trying to achieve rather than making decisions about specifically how you achieve those goals, right? Because the game takes care of that second part. And so what we did in Skylanders was a lot like that. We made a, a game that was very, tactically, there was not a lot that you could do. It was very simple tactically. But strategically, there was a lot you could do. You were always thinking about things like, uh, what is the most efficient way for me to get through here, right? Like. Uh, I could pull this guy out and fight them here because, uh, you know, uh, this guy has an attack that shoots straight ahead and there's a big gap in front of me and I can shoot over that gap and hit the enemy, right? But if I switch to Eruptor, 
Eruptor has a, a, a lava that spreads out from the center of him that would take out a group of chumpies that's running at me right now, right? So if the group of chumpies is near me, I'll want Eruptor. If the chumpies aren't there, I want a different person. If that gap wasn't there, I could run up to the other character with Eruptor and deal with the deal with him that way, right? Eruptor had a lobbed attack that could go over cover. So if there was a blockade between you and an enemy, Eruptor was good in that situation, you know? So there's there's all this push and pull going on with the enemies and the, you know, gaps and cover and ledges in the level design and the whether or not the Skylander could shoot straight ahead, whether they could lob or whether they had like area of effect or whether some other kind of way of affecting things that would change which one you wanted to use. And then on top of that, there were areas in the environment where, based on the Skylander's element, certain Skylanders would be more effective, right? So if you had a nature Skylander and you were in a nature, uh, sometimes that would be the right one to use because you got to damage. But other times you might have a, another Skylander you'd want to use because their abilities were more... T it made it really interesting... Uh, at least based on the user test feedback we got, to play the game because you were always making a lot of high-level strategic decisions, even though the low-level tactical decisions were all very simple. And uh, what would you say is your favorite part of development? My favorite part of development is when, like, uh, we're getting near the end of the game and the story and the cutscenes start coming in and you start playing the game with all the levels stitched together in the proper order and start seeing all of the uh, the, the story and cutscenes that you hadn't seen before. And all of a sudden, this, this, this game, which was a whole bunch of pieces, comes together and becomes one thing. And it's a really cool moment. And it happens on every game. Uh, that, you know, all of a sudden you have a game instead of the pieces of the game. I, I really like that part because, uh, especially if, uh, you know, not every game uh, that you work on goes on to be successful, right? But the ones that are successful, uh, there's a there's a minority of them where you're working on it and it just feels good, right? Like you you everything just sort of clicks, right? And uh, that's the way it was with Giants, where everything clicked. Like, we, we, we felt like that game was on track. Skylanders was a very different experience, right? It was an experience where we were still trying to find what the game was. So when you're, when you're having that kind of experience and it all comes together, it's, it's way more satisfying. You know, even as much as it is satisfying when you do it the other way, everything is is clicking right when you've when you've spent a lot of effort trying to find it to actually find it is very gratifying uh so what would you say is the biggest change to how something ended up in the final version of the game uh let's see early on we were trying to figure out how to get people to switch skylanders uh so, like, one of the big strategic elements of the game uh, is which Skylander do I use for this situation, right? Like, that's that's pretty much the whole thing. Uh, and uh, the one of the one of the things that we tried early on was things like there's a rock wall here, and if you have an Earth Skylander, the Earth Skylander can knock it over, right? Or there's uh, you know only water Skylanders can walk on water, or if you have a flying character, the flying character can fly over certain things, right? Like, it was this, uh, it was trying to make them useful in different situations by putting different context situations into the design, and it wasn't good. Uh, people really didn't like that, because uh, it, it would feel like you, you were using a Skylander that you got into a groove and then all of a sudden the game said nope sorry you don't get to go any further until you switch right uh 
And then we tr we tried a whole bunch of other things, and we tried the what eventually we ended up doing was we had those side paths where uh, if you switch to another Skylander, you could go into the side, play a little extra segment, and get an uh, an extra reward at the end. And so people could do that if they wanted to, or not do it if they wanted to. It was more like opt in for a reward rather than we're forcing you to do it. And it, the 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 big difference in that was uh, like you you can see how the difference in feel is. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So that was a big difference, I think. Can you reveal something, or maybe even a set of things that was scrapped from the finished game? Um, let's see. Uh, well, this this isn't technically scrapped from the finished game, but uh, do you remember the Skylander Boomer? Yes. Uh, he used to be an old man. You know, actually, I might even have an old sculpt of Boomer with the long beard. Oh, wow, but, really? Uh, yeah, yeah the, uh, w one of my friends gave me one of the, the clay models that they made uh, when they originally were, were making prototype Skylanders. They would model them out of clay. Uh, and uh, I, ha I have one of the, the bomb trolls uh that's what we called Boomer before he was Boomer. And he has this old beard, this, this old long beard. And he was originally going to be part of the starter kit. Oh, but really? nobody liked him. Huh. Uh, and the only thing that's different between Boomer uh, that shipped, really, and that the old Boomer was, the you know, he didn't have a beard. <laughs> <laughs> so for some reason, people didn't like uh, long beards in toys uh, that we found out. But uh, so that was that was something uh, that I mean, there's a lot. Uh, let's see. So early on, uh, we were making the game. It was supposed to come out. I think it, it, it actually came out in 2011. Uh, so a, uh, there was a point where we had talked 2010 to release it and we could have released it. It would have been a good game. But uh the uh, uh, a whole bunch of people got together, both at Activision and Toys for Bob, and they're like, you know, if we had an extra year on this, uh, we could we could make it for more platforms. We could use the the technology to store the information in the toys. We could make uh, levels that you know we could put a whole bunch uh, of extra content in. Like we, there was just all this stuff, and we decided to do that. When we decided to do that everything changed and so a whole bunch of uh that you know there's there were a whole bunch of levels that didn't make it into the game uh or a bunch of levels that got cut up into uh different pieces or so it's it's actually really hard to remember what made it in and what didn't because we took all of the things that we had and re basically remade them uh with that extra year that we had uh, so yeah, so there was so much. It's it's hard to even, you know, like there was a a period where we thought we were gonna need to be able to transfer money between different Skylanders. So we had a whole system in for that that we eventually didn't use because we figured there was a an exploit you could use to dupe money unless we did it in a really really arcane way and nobody could figure it out in the user testing. So. We ended up cutting it, and it ended up not being a big deal that you couldn't transfer money between the Skylanders, uh, or not that big a deal. Mm. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, there were many different iterations on the story. Uh, Flynn and Callie came in very late in the story process, like they didn't exist early on. Uh, Flynn was originally just called the balloonist and he was going to give a quest. Like he was basically uh, supposed to fly you to certain areas. And uh, once he had a personality, everybody liked him so much that he became essentially the main character of the game. <laughs> right? Like it's, uh, he's the guy that, that the, the portal master, the player sees the world through. Um, and, and that was another really interesting thing was figuring out who are you, mm. right? Like, are you the Skylander? Are you the player? Does the player actually have a, you know, who talks to the player and who talks to the Skylander, right? Like, 
there's all that all that stuff we had to figure out and all sorts of different iterations where we decided to go different ways you know for experiments and then went went the way we ended up going uh you know like how do we tell a story who is involved with the story are your, is the portal master the main character of the story or is the skylander the main character if so which skylander you know do the main characters talk to specific skylanders or do they just refer to them as skylander you know mm. uh only eon really talks to the portal master you know or eon and hugo for some reason chaos does that, every so often as well every so often right like there's there's points where it feels like it makes sense and points where you know he he only talks this uh there's a few points where chaos breaks the uh, chaos or chaos's mom break the fourth wall later on uh by referring to the portal master instead of to the the character uh so there's a lot of interesting stuff that we were able to do because we made that decision but that wasn't always the decision you know for a while the game was spyro's the main character uh for another while it was well spyro's the the story is about spyro but you can play as any of the characters you know and eventually it became the story is about you as the portal master uh wielding these skylanders to save skylanders right and that arriving at that seems very obvious now having having played the games that way but it was the result of a lot of iteration experimentation just trying to figure out what worked uh you know and, and most of the toys to life games that came afterwards uh inherited that same sort of relationship between the player and the toys by default but it's you know which makes it seem like well that was the only way you could do it but you know there are many different ways we could have done it but this was probably the best one you mentioned earlier when it was spyro's kingdom spyro was the one sort of giving tasks to the Skylanders, um, if they were even called Skylanders at that point. They were minions, I think, at that point. Interesting. So that was going to be my question. Was Spyro like a bad guy? <laughs> Cause, no. Because it was just were, like, oh, were... minions, make me my castle. Like <laughs> Minions was the development name. Right. And, and for the same reason you pointed out, we didn't call them minions, right? Yeah. Because it sounds like something like a villain said. Uh, for a while, they were called champions, right? They tried a whole bunch of different uh names for them and it wasn't until uh uh i think one of the producers on the activision side suggested skylander as what we called them that the whole concept and the 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 name and everything clicked together in terms of what these things were they were skylanders they were mighty heroes right like that you as the portal master were wielding uh, and that, that ended up being the one that was the strongest. This is going to be like a pretty open question. Um, but uh, what would you say is the weirdest or funniest thing that happens during development? And by all means, you can stretch this to any game in the franchise, because I'm aware of it. Um, it. Some memories may be easier to remember than others. The weirdest or the funniest thing? Yeah, or both. Um... <laughs> Uh, you know, the, uh, I didn't know that for Swap Force, that, uh, what's her name was going to be a, a musical, that the, the, the puppet fight, what was her name? Oh, yes. Um, Mesmeralda. Mesmeralda, yeah. I'm the one who pulls your strings, that whole thing. Oh, God, that was awesome, right? But that was a surprise. To uh, like, there was a boss fight that we had been playing, but nobody had told us that there was going to be a, a whole musical sequence around it and so one day we got a bill and there was the musical sequence and it was like oh my god That was really funny because, uh, like, uh, you don't usually, you, you're not usually surprised by something that big and that fun. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Usually, usually when you're making a game, you know you're playing before you play it. Uh, like, as a player, you go into that situation, Mesmerelda sings the song and does the whole thing, and, and you feel that whole thing, right, for the first time having not expected it. 
we actually got to feel that because we we weren't expecting it and it's really rare to have that happen when you're actually working on the game that's really cool so uh you worked for vicarious visions as well yeah i uh, i was still at uh activision still i would fly over to vicarious visions uh several times a month sometimes for a few weeks at a time uh to help with swap for us uh, i left activision uh, to, to form my own consulting company like shortly before the release or, or shortly before the uh, final build of swap force uh, but then i contracted on it a little bit so i didn't work on it as much as i did with giants and uh spyro's adventure but i did help with it a considerable amount so how difficult is that when you have to leave home for quite a long period of time really really difficult yeah especially when you have to travel cross country and change time zones a bunch it it does a lot to your body you know just having to change when you're waking up you know uh changing when you're eating all that stuff uh and and then adjusting back when you fly back uh but flying up to novato from you know southern california wasn't anywhere nearly as hard even though I did it way more often because I was still in the same time zone, the same state, you know? Yeah. I had access to all, I, I, you know, I wasn't going to be gone as long. So I still had access to my stuff. If, like to, if I needed to bring something with me, it was easier to bring with me, you know, we, all that stuff. So it was easier, definitely, uh, traveling within the same, you know, within a, like a 500 mile trip compared to a several thousand mile trip. Mm hmm. Um, and I traveled relatively little. My boss, uh, at the time, he was, he was constantly traveling. He was traveling all the time. So yeah, the, that job, the analyst job, uh, it requires tons of travel, which is very difficult, but, uh, I, I liked it. You know, I didn't like the cross country stuff as that was really hard, for me, but the, the, it was kind of a fresh thing. You know, I got to travel outside the country a few times. That was fun. Uh, mainly to Canada, different parts of Canada. Like I went up to uh, Quebec, which is where um, Beanox is, and Vancouver, which was where Radical was. Uh, got to fly to Florida uh, to visit a third-party developer once. That was cool. We went to a uh, we went to a carnival and like went on all the rides it was fun <laughs> so uh you sort of alluded to it a little bit but i was going to ask you um what have you worked on since working on skylanders uh let's see so after skylanders i uh i was consulting so i can skylanders i consulted on ratchet nexus and ratchet ps4 uh superchargers was the only skylanders game i didn't do any consulting on uh but the other ones I did, uh, and um, let's see what else. I worked with a few other smaller uh, developers, and then then I spent some time in Pennsylvania at a, uh, the Harrisburg University of Science and Technology uh, as their game designer in residence. So I was working with students and helping them with their projects, and I got to teach a summer camp for high school students on video game design in unity that was fun uh helped with their level design program a bit and then uh, came back and now i'm working uh for activision again uh right now i'm working at toys for bob and that's about it so yeah you've done quite a bit in the last like five years or so yeah it's been it's i've, I've moved so many times man it's it's been uh it's been a quite a journey yeah, and they say moving is the most stressful thing you can do, so... It is so stressful, I have man. so much respect for you. It's been like nine moves. Oh my god! <laughs> Some of them across the country. <laughs> so yeah, a lot. A lot has happened. Yeah. I guess, uh, final question for you. Uh, what advice do you have for aspiring developers? Um, like, advice about anything in particular um i guess uh maybe getting into the industry or um just 
just any general advice that you have? I mean, there's, sure, of yeah. course, rule number one, if you want to bring that up. Well, let's see. So, uh, you know, even before that point, uh, I get it that frequently asked question from people about like, how do they even apply to a game industry job? Like that, that's a fairly useful set of information. Like, um, I'll try to do it as briefly as I can. Basically, uh, when you're like, let's say you're trying to get a job as a, or a programmer, uh, there's several steps in the process. At first, you're, you're sending in a resume, a letter, and you're trying to get them to have a phone interview with you. The phone interview is basically to see whether they want to bring you in on site for a real interview. And then once you get the real interview, that's when you're, you know, uh, if you do well at that, that's when you're in line for the job. Uh, the best way, uh, if, you're, if you're somebody who doesn't have experience in the industry, uh, you need to look for what are, uh, for entry level jobs in what you're looking for. So don't apply as like a game director if you've never worked on a game before because you probably won't get that. Uh, you want to look for the the kinds of jobs that in the field you want to go into, right? Art or design or programming, but that are for people who are new to the industry. Usually things they'll, they'll be something like a junior designer or associate designer, you know, try to find those jobs and uh, uh, apl uh, apply for those and, you know, write down what, what the things that you have done that would make you qualify for that job, right? So you look at the job listing, they say, they say what they want from you, you give them a resume and a cover letter that shows how you give them what they want for that, right? And then you just do that until you get a job. The best place I've, I've found for looking for that kind of stuff besides job boards are things like, uh, there's a website called gamedevmap.com and it's a map of the world. Click on your, and it'll show all the developers and publishers that are in your area. And you can go to their job sites and look and see if they have any entry level positions. Uh, basically any, anywhere near you, find, find an entry level position and apply for it. Uh, if you have education, that'll help you out. If you don't, you can still apply for it with your experience, you know, as a hobbyist developer. Just make sure that they know what you've done that makes you meet the qualifications in the job posting that you found for that entry-level position. Uh, and then that leads to rule number one, which is you, you don't want to be a jerk. You don't want to talk crap. You don't want to... It's a small industry. Be kind. Uh, you know, be professional. And, uh, you know, like you'll, you'll get jobs and once you get jobs, you because if you're easy to work with and you're good at what you do, other people will recommend you, you know, other people say, Hey, we have a job over here, but getting that first job is the hard bit and you'll, you'll have to do quite a bit of legwork for it. Well, thank you very much for joining me. I mean, it's, it is always an absolute pleasure to speak with you and, uh, I absolutely love, <laughs> some of the stories you've told and the advice you've given and just yeah it's been it's been fantastic thank you thank you very much teal it's been great to be had i it's it's been fun walking down memory so uh, i'm looking forward to seeing this when you release it Thank you very much for watching, I hope you enjoyed the video, if you did, leave a like, subscribe, share the video around, I also have a Twitch, a Twitter and a Patreon if you would like to support me and the channel. As you can probably tell, this is a massive passion project of mine that I've been working on for quite some time, and I'm really glad that I'm able to get it out to you, and I'm really grateful for you watching the video. If you want to see more from the series or other stuff that I do on this channel, click that notification bell to be notified when I upload next. But thank you very much for watching, I'll see you next time, take care, bye bye. <laughs>